It's hard to imagine how a town could sprout from such an unforgiving landscape. You come to America to look for a better life. They brought with them that hard work ethic. Hewn out of a mountain, propped up over the water on stilts. Men who come to Alaska are sometimes renegades, looking for a better life or running away from something. Built by miscreants and missionaries, merchants and mountain men, women of valor, and ladies of negotiable affection. strong, they're motivated because of hardship. A kaleidoscope of characters forged a frontier and built a community like no other in America. But before Ketchikan was even a twinkle in God's eye, there were salmon. Who knows when the first salmon spawned along the banks of Ketchikan Creek? According to native lore, the Clinket people had been setting up seasonal fish camps along the creek since the beginning of time. Ketchikan Creek is not just any old creek. It's the why that my ancestry came here to this location for thousands of years usually arrived by mid-June, men here through the end of September, processing salmon by smoking or sun-drying. There are probably as many different versions of how Ketchikan got its name as there are people in Ketchikan. There are a variety of variations on it based on a clinket word, Khan. When you hear the whooshing sound of the eagle's wings flying by you, in our Tlingit language we say Keshkhan. Keshkhan means the thunder and rings of an eagle. There is no one answer that, that everyone agrees to. The word Khan means home or house or even you know, area belonging to someone. And everyone would say, well, Kitsch Khan means that it was Kitsch's area. Of course, that begs the question, who was Kitsch? As far as we know, there was no Kitsch. I asked Forrest Dewitt Sr., I said, how did Kitsch Khan get its name? He said, well, I think it's Kikshan Han. Han is Crick. And Kikshan means white spot on a fish. And a white spot on a fish is a spawned out salmon. Kikshan Han, it means the cycle of life and the continuing cycle of life for many, many generations. And that's a pretty nice name. Like any valuable treasure, Ketchikan Creek salmon have been a source of contention since the town began. Legend has it that Ketchikan actually started over a fish fight. Ketchikan in the 1890s was primarily a collection of shacks and a couple of businesses huddled around the mouth of Ketchikan Creek. Loring was a real town, Ketchikan was not. And those two communities ended up going into a, a battle to the death, so to speak. 
the folks up in Loring felt that they owned that creek. And they came down here and tried to basically set up nets at the front of the creek and take all the salmon before they could get up the creek. What you ended up with having was a salmon war, where you actually had fist fights and people fighting in boats and stuff at the mouth of the creek. Ketchikan won, Loring still exists, it's a small little village, but Ketchikan is now the real community. The Lord's Army began arriving in Ketchikan in the late 1800s. There to save and to serve, missionaries promised to build schools and churches for the native people if they moved in from their remote villages. When, when the missionaries came into uh, this area, um, we were seeing the need for education. And some of the leaders, the native leaders at that time, uh, they probably agreed with the changing of times that uh, they would see that their, their children and generations that come would have to have education. The Episcopalian here in Ketchikan uh, was more domineering as I understand it. Uh, you're going to be an Episcopalian whether you like it or not. You're going to our church and you're going to go to our school. That was the beginning of assimilation from the Tlingit culture into the Western world. With native groups no longer scattered throughout coastal southeast, and miners, loggers, and other transient workers constantly coming and going, there was a convergence of people from two very different worlds. Missionaries were integral to helping Alaska natives find some peace amidst a difficult time of forced assimilation into Western culture. Sister Agnes is a pretty special uh, lady here in Ketchikan. It, reportedly, she's the first single white female in town. So she was this lone missionary establishing this mission in this town of hardworking men. She came here in 1898 to serve as a missionary, and she worked with the uh, Native Alaskans in this area, the missionary was here for their benefit. The native community gave her the, a name which she said was too hard to pronounce, so she just let people know that it meant the silver-eyed mother. The richness of the natural resources in southeast Alaska that enabled native Tlingit people to subsist for millennia was also a siren for pioneers from the lower 48 and beyond. Fishermen from the east coast in Norway. Seasonal cannery workers from China, Japan and the Philippines. Loggers, miners and other salty characters. As Alaska's first city, Ketchikan served as a waypoint for the swarms of prospectors hiking their way up to the Klondike during the massive gold rush. The Klondike gold rush of 1897-98, 100,000 people passed through this area going north. A lot of them didn't get anything up there. They, they, they found nothing. They, and quite a few didn't want to go home and admit they were failures, I guess, so they, they stopped here on the way back, and that, that sort of started the boom here in the 1890s. In the early days, certainly, Ketchikan was a mining community. Um, if you go back to the Articles of Incorporation in 1900, 
um, of the 100 people who signed that, 80 of them were involved in the mining industry in some way. After the town started filling up with miners and loggers, then came the merchants, builders, boat makers, and scow loads of fishermen. Everyone from that era is gone now. There's no question the Inmans were one of the first ones here. No question about that. Ott Inmans came here in the yeah, I think it was 1890, more or less. Married a Clinkett gal. When he came, first came here with these other fellows, they, they were Caucasian also. And he met Chief Johnson, became very good friends. Chief Johnson and my grandfather, they were kind people. That's probably why they got along so well. Ott Edmonds, he was a very interesting entrepreneur. He's the one who really started the shingle mill over on Creek Street. After building that 22-foot water wheel, harnessing the power of Ketchikan Creek to do that, bringing cedar logs up the creek, producing 10,000 shingles a day, it's hard for me to believe anyone could do that today. My grandfather always wanted to be a boat builder. When he was here, there was a very little industry. He was one of the very earliest people, and, and he was very adept. So he, he tried out a lot of little different things to make sure he had the right mix of business types. He had a steam box, and then he put lumber in that steam box, and when it was soft enough to bend, he'd, he'd put it on the shell of the boat. And then I used to help him caulk the seams, and when he was done, I'd get to burn the star in the back of the boat. His shop was the Star Boat Shop. You know, we all kind of do that in Alaska today. It's, we, we get very adept at doing a lot of different things in a small town like Ketchikan so we can stay here and live here. While Ott Inman and others worked to build early infrastructure, others, like Forrest and Harriet Hunt, began to build a community. My great-grandparents, Harriet and Forrest Hunt, were here right in the beginning, along with a very small amount of other people. Yeah, they started things up and kept it going. They could have left. <laughs> the Hunt family was also very interested in building sort of the social life of Ketchikan. My great-grandfather had a store. They sold groceries and meat, eventually books and postcards, and kind of got into the tourist thing when the steamships would come into Ketchikan. Throughout the history of Ketchikan, you had steamships coming. You had visitors. You had curio shops. You know, some of the earliest businesses in Ketchikan along the waterfront were curio shops. Back in the day, the steamships that would arrive brought a lot of visitors that wanted to see this great faraway land they call Alaska. Seasonal cannery workers have been coming from Asian countries to Ketchikan since the fishing industry began in the early 1900s. They first started, uh, they had Chinese crews and Filipino crews. My grandfather, Jimmy Tatsuda came around 1910 and helped work in the cannery and can salmon and then would leave at the end of the season. One year he just decided to not go back with the cans and stayed in town. When I, I was growing up I could remember five Japanese families I believe but there were more before World War II. Everyone was affected by the war. Ketchikan's Ward Cove became a refugee camp for the Aleuts, and the town's 42 Japanese residents were relocated to internment camps in the lower 48. The Japanese in Ketchikan were given notice, very short notice, that they were to report and show up with whatever they could carry, a couple of suitcases, 
and get on a boat and be shipped off to a relocation camp. Pete Johnson was in the Army then, and he said he had tears in his eyes when he was standing down at the dock with his rifle, making sure that they all got on the boats. With such short notice, they had all of the inventory, and apparently my grandfather gave this inventory to the customers. When they were such good citizens of the town, the people of Ketchikan were very, very angry about it. Apparently after they relocated the Japanese during World War II, some of them didn't come back. An old customer would come up to me and just tell me a story. And I remember Norrin Olson, who was an older guy by then, and he started crying. And he said, back in the old days when the sawmill would be closed for months on end and they didn't have a paycheck. He would, my grandfather would let him charge his groceries at the store. And uh, he'd get home from, from the store and he'd find $5 bills and $10 bills in with the groceries, um, also on credit. But without asking, my grandfather had lent him money basically and uh, it was just very touching. It makes me kind of cry just thinking about it. It just seems like it's always been that way where you help your neighbor, everybody. And it's not exclusive at all. Yeah, that's one of the great things about Ketchikan. Many Filipinos came to do seasonal work in the canneries, but others made the long journey in search of a better life. There was a demand for nurses in Kitchikan. My mom said, well, if you have seen a better future for you, you must, you know, go. That was my first trip to leave home in an airline, which was by propeller. It took me 33 hours to get to Kitchigan. I think I'm the second Filipino woman that got to Kitchigan. There's just this little handful of nurses running this small hospital. They were very hardworking. You can imagine all the accidents that took place at the Spruce Miller, building buildings and fishing and mining and stuff. You can tell what accident, if it's arm, I think it's fishing, and when it's a leg, it's lagging. They were the uh, forces that kept this place a successful hospital and supporting this community. They worked night and day, they were tireless, they did a beautiful job. And we worked together help one another. Norwegians made up the largest immigrant population in early Ketchikan. After overfishing fairly destroyed the halibut fishery in Norway, seafarers, fishermen, and others traveled to Alaska, where there were plenty of fish in the sea. When the sailors came to town, there would just be hundreds of boats. We used to say we could walk across the whole bay just walking from one boat to the other. It was so crowded. Fishing was what they did best. They constituted the vast majority of people that were listed as mariners, uh, boat captains, fishermen, cannery workers. and they'd go out every morning and troll for salmon and they'd come back every evening and us kids would be on the beaches and on the floats and stuff. Make bets as to whose dad had the most fish. 
they hunted and trapped in the winter and fished in the summer, and it was very much a subsistence kind of life. My Norwegian culture informed who I was. As a child, my dad would sing us lullabies in Norwegian, and they would sing songs and do dances and do things that reminded them of home. The Norwegians were quick to establish their own church, which joined an already robust community of churches. When the Norwegians came over here, I think establishing things as fundamental as their religious beliefs was very important. That's been there a long time. I think since I was in first grade, they make coffee and have cookies and all the Norwegian pastries and things. If you like to eat, that's a place to go, the Lutheran church after church. And we eat to celebrate. Good stuff. The Newtown area began being developed before 1900. The folks that lived there were really reliant on the fishing industry. There were fleets of halibut boats in a place they called Captain's Hill, so they built some nice houses there where they could look down on their boats. We could all see the water from where we lived. There must have been a hundred Norwegian families. My grandfather came from a small fjord up in way up in northern Norway. The first time I went to Bergen, I was struck by how similar some of the houses there looked to the houses that my, my grandparents lived in. Most of them didn't speak English until they'd been here a few years. I know with my mom and dad, they were anxious to learn. You couldn't have breakfast without having a spelling bee. While the Norwegians and other Caucasian immigrants lived downtown or in Newtown, natives and other people of color were relegated to their own areas of town. Indian town. This is not a real bright time for catch cat. White settlers who were investing all they had in their lives here and somehow they felt that minorities uh, shouldn't have uh, a role, maybe not own key properties. Right where Chief Johnson's pole is and it goes back one square mile that was set aside primarily for the Tlingit people. We as Tlingit people could not leave that. I remember as a child in this one restaurant had a, had a sign in the window, uh, no Indians or dogs. Being a half-breed was the toughest thing I could go through. They always considered me, instead of the white side, you know, they always considered me the native side. As I remember as a kid, we couldn't go on the other side of the tunnel. 
because that was Newtown. Before my grandfather even came here, the natives owned property all the way down past the St. John's Church because they were here first. And that was their land, all of this. It was really a terrible time. The boundaries were clear in Ketchikan. The minorities lived in Indian Town. The Norwegians and other Caucasian immigrants lived in Newtown. And the more colorful characters? Well, they occupied Creek Street, Ketchikan's notorious red light district. It's like the Wild West. The first time you have anything new, a lot of single men come because they're the ones that are going to be doing the work. And the men out in the sawmills and out in the logging camps, with their pockets full of money, they needed some entertainment. They had the beginning of Creek Street. By the mid-1920s, Ketchikan was a bustling city of well over 5,000 people, and if one is to believe the Honorable Judge James Wickersham, the town was bustling with vice and corruption. It was charged that Uncle Sam, while posing as a moralist, is encouraging and, in effect, maintaining in Ketchikan and Bristol Bay, Alaska, conditions of vice and crime such as cannot be matched elsewhere on this continent. A disreputable and criminal element has invaded and occupied Indian Town, establishing there a red light district with 200 or more bad women, and making it a colony of bootleggers, dope sellers, gunmen, and low-class people who are crowding out the gentle and inoffensive Indians. Ketchikan, Alaska is a terrible town. One might even gather that it is about the worst pest hole in America. It is the wickedest town. There were places of reception for uh, illegal alcohol coming into Alaska. Boats could pull in and offload and doing illegal alcohol. And people would come up in the skiffs and go up underneath the sidewalks to deliver booze, we called it, up into the ladies' houses. And it was a pretty exciting time. The madams of Creek Street may have been ladies of negotiable affection, but they were also shrewd businesswomen who were a very important part of the community. Dolly Arthur, Thelma Baker, and Black Mary, all of them worked down here. These were pioneer women that came to Alaska and followed adventure, you know, or, or just economic necessity. Many of them came to be involved in gold mining and just realized they could make more money doing what they did. Virtually every property were owned by the women themselves. I think the women that were here were really strong. They were great friends to fishermen and miners and others. They were often like sisters and mothers to some people. Emery Tobin was very outspoken. He really loved Alaska and wanted to share it with people. Oh, he was a fiery little guy. He wasn't Norwegian, so he was kind of short and kind of stubby, and, and he did a lot of talking, though, and he was smart. He wanted us to put our best foot forward, and Emery didn't quite think that Creek Street was our best foot, and really started a propaganda, so to speak, campaign to close down the ladies' businesses there on Creek Street. There were enough of the, the truly good people in town to close down this improper place. He succeeded eventually. There were others that jumped in the fight here and there, and I think it was 1954 was the official closing of the creek. Right after World War I, kids grew up in a hurry then, or starved to death. We had to trap. We hunted and trapped bear, because bear was a good price. The Johnstone family, Bruce and Jack and Dan Lugger Jackson, they were well-known hunting experts, guides. Bruce, it's just hard to describe a guy like that. He was just an all-around type Alaskan that people would like to be with and listen to his stories. He had some real good ones. 58, I got chewed up a barrel. My first shot fired all right, but there were three bear. 
Oh uh, yeah. Well, I I didn't kill two. I crippled one and killed one. And uh, I tried for the biggest one first. And uh, just as I pulled the trigger on him, the, the female hit me and knocked me down. And I had one shell left in the gun. And I swung to save that last shell for the big one. The one that was working on me then was uh, a two-year-old. And I figured I could handle it, that one. But uh, they chewed me up pretty bad. I don't know how I ever survived. When a man is scared, he can do things that he couldn't think of doing, ordinarily, I think. The river running down was just red with, with blood down there. Both of it was mine. <laughs> but they, that was quite a bear hunt. <laughs> By the mid-30s, Ketchikan was quickly becoming the salmon canning capital of the world. It was also rife with creative, entrepreneurial minds. Well, Mr. Heckman was one of the very first who came here and started his trading company. He was also looking for the next big thing. One of these entrepreneurs who did a, a lot of interesting things in the community uh, to make his way and ended up being quite a significant leader in the community. He invented the fish trap, which was a very big deal. At the peak of the fish trap era, there were 800 traps in the state of Alaska, all strategically placed at catch fish along their predictive paths, and they were workhorses, responsible for trapping two-thirds of all the salmon being processed in the state. Big canneries, like New England Fish Company, Nackett Packing Company, they had their own traps. Every mile there was a fish trap in the southeast. The fish traps, most of which were owned by corporations in the lower 48, became symbols to what Alaskans believed was a colonial empire bent on usurping their resources. I started fishing with a trolling boat that I got, did some, some things that I don't mention with my boat that I didn't use trolling gear to do it with. It wasn't long before locals realized how easy it was to reclaim their fish by brailing the traps under cover of darkness stealing from the cannery who owned the trap. They call us fish pirates. This guy says, your name Diamond? Yeah. He said, did you ever know a Harry Diamond? I said, I knew three of them. This one, my dad and my grandpa. He says, your grandpa and I were pirates together in, in Ketchikan. There, everybody that what I know of was always out robbing traps. 1929 was the peak year for the industry, and Heckman was reported to have said, well, boys, we got them all. He died in 1939, the year his prediction proved accurate. The salmon had been overfished, and their numbers were in decline. We wanted statehood down here primarily due to the fisheries. We were sick and tired of federal control of fish traps. They'd almost fished the herring out of existence. Salmon were definitely on a downhill run. Fishermen from Ketchikan were present and very vocal at the state constitutional convention, winning the argument for a ban on fish traps. Because of their efforts, Alaska's salmon will be a sustainable resource for generations to come. You know, this near euphoria when we became a state in 1959. In the White House, President Eisenhower signs the proclamation that makes Alaska's entry into the Union official. And across the country, manufacturers go into action, bringing the stars and stripes up to date. Fish traps were banned when Alaska became a state. 
There was dancing on the street, and we got to dance on the dock to a live band, and there was a party. And it, it meant you could stay out after curfew, which we all did. We just partied. While the new state began to pick up the pieces of its commercial fishery, another industry began to boom. There were a lot of events that happened then. The pulp mill was being built. The tunnel was being punched through. Lots and lots of men came here, single men. But there were men everywhere, and they were wild and woolly guys. You wouldn't take most of them home to meet your mother. Yeah, there's a lot of men in Alaska. The odds are really good, but boy, the goods are odd. <laughs> in Ketchikan, we had a logging community that would fly into town, spend their money boisterously, and it was wild. In the logging days, it wasn't unusual to see a guy sitting in a bar and blow, you know, $1,500, $2,000 on a weekend just buying rounds for the house. And you had some of the uh, most interesting collections of personalities and characters you ever cared to see. So we saw like a boom in the 50s and 60s. The economy was always on the upward swing and doing business here was just a, like a, being in a boom town. For over 40 years, logging and related industries employed nearly 30% of the people in Ketchikan. The whole town benefited from those big boom years, which meant that the whole town was affected when the boom went bust. Certainly all the industries in this area are cyclical. But the interesting thing is in most communities, when an industry goes under, the town goes under. Here, the town has just kept going and sort of reinvented itself. Ketchikan has never stayed the same ever. You might as well just think of it as change. The Ketchikan community has done a good job of preserving its history and heritage sites. One of the first restoration projects was tied to the Civilian Conservation Corps, established by President Roosevelt in the 1930s. In Southeast Alaska, this meant employing carvers to recreate totem poles that had been left behind when the native people moved from their coastal villages. Well, my grandfather was um, a well-known carver in his days, and he assisted on the CCC project. During the CCCs throughout America, they played a good part in, as far as bringing back totem poles in, in the new founded villages. They're examples for today's younger generations. If it wasn't done, all these poles that we had would probably have disintegrated and degraded into nothing, and we wouldn't have them today. I'm able to look at works of my great-grandfather also and my, my grandfather, so these parks are pretty vital to us. The project was a great success, and as a result, Ketchikan is home to the largest collection of standing totem poles in the world. Ketchikan has more historic properties than any other city of Alaska. We built a lot of buildings in the early 1900s, uh, and they remain today. Oh, my. Well, I guess all these buildings are on here younger than I am. <laughs> we have a very committed group of people who want to do everything they can to tell the story of Ketchikan, to protect what we have. Buildings and neighborhoods that are deteriorated and via historic preservation bring those buildings and neighborhoods to life. Creek Street was a good example. It was all a rundown neighborhood. Uh, buildings falling into the creek, only a few left. It had played such a role in our history. 
So many of these other buildings have played significant roles too. You want to be able to document that, remind people of the history of their community. You want to preserve that character in the community. People haven't paid close attention to their own backyards at their own places. And somehow we did here. So when it was ready to bloom, it did. It bloomed beautifully. They say history repeats itself and sometimes I really hope that that is true because we've got some great history here that's definitely worth repeating. There's a lot of hard-headed stubbornness here, and that's why we're still here 100 years later. Preserving our history, and more importantly, sharing it with people. History doesn't have to be dry, historic colors don't have to be boring. History can really be just the glorious window to your past to understand how this town evolved and why. The future is pretty solid. We've weathered some pretty tough storms already. This is a town without pretense. It just gets down, it's bar fight nasty sometimes, you know, but it's also just rich and alive and rough and tumble and it's fun to be around. Then they go on to refer Ketchikan as the worst pest hole in America. It is the wickedest town. That makes me proud. I want to go back to my little smokehouse in Craig, Alaska. I want to be with all the hiders and the clinkets that I used to know. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> What did you know about Creek Street? I don't want to tell you my secrets. <laughs> the recess rule was you had to be within hearing of the bell. Other than that, there was no rules. You were two trees away from freedom. Once you turned that corner, your mother couldn't see you again. That I remember as a kid, and that's all we did was play outside. It didn't matter to us whether it was pouring down rain or not. We just did. The mountains are splendid, the forest is a wonder. It's hard to be bored here. And I could, I could, be, I could, I could be bored in Anchorage, in Fairbanks, in Naknek, in Prudhoe Bay. Actually, just this last week, there was a woman who was assaulted with a fish. Did you see that? I don't know if you noticed that, but she was struck across the face with a fish, just like a Monty Python routine, the fish dance. Because not only does it talk about our resource and our heritage, it also talks about the fact that Ketchikan may not be a, a, a fighting town, but we are a town that specializes in what we call recreational conflict. The simple fact that you'd have a, you'd have a story in the newspaper saying that someone hit someone with a fish. Yeah, that's Ketchikan in a nutshell. <laughs>